Joining us now on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sarah Seeger. She is professor of planetary science and physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, how are things on the north side of the Charles River these days, Sarah? Pretty windy today. Pretty windy. Nice okay. to be here, Steve. Glad to have you on the program. I, I want to start just very generally here and sort of bring up to speed those who may not know anything about this uh, Kepler mission. So let's just start from scratch. What's the mission about? The mission is about finding exoplanets, planets that orbit stars other than the Sun. And in fact, the Kepler mission, it's a space telescope. It's different from Hubble, but similar kind of in the big picture. And you should know that Kepler is the very first space telescope made that is dedicated to finding planets around other stars. So when you say finding planets around other stars, meaning there are other planets out there that are not in our solar system, but Kepler's job is to find those ones. That's why they're called exoplanets? Exactly. Now let's back up for a minute. Our Sun has planets, eight mm -hmm. planets or more, depending on how you categorize them. Mm -hmm. So it should seem natural that, because every other star out there is like a sun, that they should have planets too. But actually, only in the last 15 or 20 years have astronomers been able to find those planets. And what they have found has been completely surprising. Okay, follow up on that. What's so surprising about what they found? Well, what is so surprising is that, first of all, with our solar system, we have small planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars relatively close to the sun and the big planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune really far from the Sun. And people had made a whole understanding of how planets form and how solar systems should be based on ours. And it turns out these other ones are all over, completely crazy. You can find another planetary system with a big Jupiter where Mercury should be. Hmm. Kepler has found a planetary system with five planets that would be orbiting interior to where a Mercury should be. So basically exoplanets can come in all masses and all sizes and all separations from their star. So when you say completely crazy, that's obviously a, a scientific specialized term from MIT, right? <laughs> well, let's just say there's so many surprises, we're still trying to put everything together. Gotcha, okay. Uh, Kepler, the name itself, where does that come from? That comes from Johannes Kepler from about 400 years ago, who arguably is the first astrophysicist. Okay. Kepler took data yeah, Kepler basically took data and formulated some laws of planetary orbits. Now you just compare the, and the telescope Kepler... Is named, the telescope is, telescope is named in his honor. Sure. Uh, you just told us that it's, you know, you compared it to the Hubble telescope. So go a little further on that if you would. How does this telescope actually, how does it actually do its job? Well, first of all, Hubble and Kepler are both telescopes that operate at visible wavelengths, similar wavelengths to what we can see with our eye. But Hubble is an all-purpose telescope. If you ever read about Hubble, it's making one kind of discovery about galaxies, another kind about planets. Ke Hubble can look at many, many, many different kinds of astronomical objects. Kepler, on the other hand, is designed to only do one thing over and over and over and over again. And what Kepler is doing is staring at one field of star and taking pictures of it. It's like as if you took your cell phone, pointed it to the sky, and every six seconds took a picture over and over and over again for years. That's what Kepler is doing, essentially. And where is it transmitting those images back to? Back to Earth. And they're images of, one star, of a star field of 150,000 stars. Hmm. When you say back to Earth, but where specifically? Well, I mean, is there a, is the there data a, actually... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, the data comes down to Earth and eventually goes to NASA Ames, where it is all processed. And people take those images and to make a long story short, look for planets in the data. And how much information can Kepler give us about the planets that it actually does spot? Kepler can give us really two things about the planet, two major things about the planet. One is the planetary size. The other is the planetary orbit, that is its year, how long its year is, and how far it is from its star. Hmm. So that's what Kepler gives us. Gotcha. But in fact, I want you to take a diff slightly different image, because what Kepler gives us is a measurement of the brightness of a star with time. It's looking for to see if the star's brightness changes with time in a way that would give away the presence of a planet. And what has it found out so far about that? Well, Kepler so far has found over 1,200 planet candidates, tw over 1,200 signatures that look like they might be planets around other stars. And that's compared to what we know now, as we know about 500 exoplanets. So Kepler has found more planets than we, we have so far. Have any of these planets been named yet? 
Great question. You know, we'd love to give the planet our favorite name, like the name of our cat or our dog or, <laughs> or our child or something like that. But, you know, the planets just get named after Kepler. So the first planet Kepler has found out of these 1,200, about fi out, out of the 1,200, 15 planets are confirmed. And they're called Kepler 1b, Kepler 2b, Kepler 3b, etc. And if the system has more than one planet, they get called Kepler 11b, Kepler 11c, Kepler 11d. So it's actually not that exciting name. They're more catalog names. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you people are obviously very smart, but not very imaginative. That's, there's really, you, you could do way ah, better on planet It's not about imagination. Names. No, no, no. Actually, it's about disagreements, because no one could agree who should get to name them and what they should be named. And so we had to revert to kind of the most simple, straightforward way possible. Now, let me tell you one other thing. The stars that Kepler is looking at, they have no names. Like some stars do, like you might have heard of the North Star, which is also called Polaris or stars in the Big Dipper, which are called Ursa Majoris stars. Sure. But in fact, the Kepler stars are so faint, nobody has ever named them. So the stars themselves get a name. That would be Kepler 1, and the planet would be called Kepler 1b, lowercase b, etc. So yeah, it's really more that we couldn't agree on who should get the privilege of naming them. You guys really ought to figure that out, because my hunch is you'll get more people interested in this project if you've got some fancy names either after your cat or whatever. That's just a little tip. You can do it's what you want with it. Okay, thanks. It's a great idea. I'll pass it along to the rest of the Kepler team. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure you will. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to put a headline up here. And uh, let me just ask our director, Michael Smith, to bring this graphic up. And I want to find out from you how accurate you think this is. This is the cover of McLean's magazine. And the headline is, The Biggest Story in the Universe. Scientists just discovered 1,200 new planets. Dozens could support life. And we've barely started looking. We are not alone. How accurate is that? Well, it's a bit of an over-exaggeration, I will say. I will also say the article written inside the magazine is fantastic and excellent. So every viewer should go ahead and read that article. It's accurate. It summarizes what's happening with Kepler. It's well done. The person who wrote the headline got a little excited, but just a little, because it really is a really big story. For thousands of years, people have wondered, are there other planets like Earth? Are they common? And do any have signs of life? So Kepler is actually going to answer these, some of these ancient questions. Kepler hasn't answered it yet because the data presented and the story is about the first four months of data. It'll take years to actually answer the question about other Earths. We're not picking on McLean's here. We get that you've got to put a provocative headline on the cover of a magazine in order to sell well, actually, it. Actually, I don't know who chose that. <laughs> I don't know who chose that headline. Well, the, but, but the what, headline certainly got attention. Yeah, what, what yeah. part of that headline perhaps overstates the case somewhat? Well, it's not yet the biggest story in the universe. I mean, what would be the biggest story in the universe will be when we do find a planet like Earth and we do find signs of life in the atmosphere. That will be the biggest story in the universe. But Kepler is just the first step. It's like taking a baby step before you can run. Kepler's doing that very first step, and that's what's happening. So we don't have the biggest story yet. If you sort of put the words before that, the first step to the biggest story in the universe, I think we'd all be happy with that. I don't want to get into a whole, you know, critique of the media's coverage of all this here, but, but media can, in its desire to capture some attention, distort what's going on out there. Have you found that to be typical in your uh, association with this idea? Absolutely. The media wants to deliver a clear-cut message. But what Kepler is finding is not clear-cut at all. Because Kepler's goal is not to say that star has a planet exactly like Earth. Kepler's goal is to say how common are other Earths. So Kepler wants to just tell us the free Kepler is designed to tell us the frequency of other Earths. It's like a gigantic census, like going around Canada and knocking on everybody's door and counting up all the, you know, Earth-sized people or Earth-sized objects. Kepler is going to do a census. And the, the media wants to tell the public, we have a planet like Earth, we have found life, but that actually is not what Kepler's doing. And that, I think that's where the confusion comes in in trying to communicate Kepler's science to the public. Hmm. So there's often confusion here. We saw some animation uh, just a few minutes ago while you were talking of what Kepler looks like, but uh, that picture doesn't really convey how big it is. How big is it? Kepler's, the diameter of Kepler is about, it's over a meter. So it would be about like this. Okay. And then it would take up a couple of stories probably. It's about a thousand kilograms. So Kepler is pretty big. Gotcha. Okay, one of the, th uh, you've told us that you know, those of us who are Star Trek fans would understand this reference that you're looking for Class M planets out there in our huge galaxy. You're looking for Earth-like planets. How many have you found so far? Well, let's back up a little, because here's where we get into some confusion. You would not believe how long, 
you wouldn't believe how many, many hours we have spent trying to define Earth-like. What is Earth-like? But Kepler actually won't even find anything Earth-like. Let's be precise. Kepler will find Earth-sized objects in Earth-like orbits about Sun-like stars. And the reason I'm emphasizing this particular point is because Earth and Venus are both earth size. Hmm. But on Earth, we have this wonderful planet with oceans and teeming with life. On Venus, there's a massive greenhouse effect, making the surface hot enough to melt lead and not suitable for any life at all. So Kepler itself couldn't distinguish between a planet like Venus that was overheated or a planet like Earth that is perfectly suitable for life. So Kepler will find Earth-sized planets, not necessarily Earth-like planets. Understood. So let's, I want to just try to communicate that point to, to everybody. Now, I appreciate the distinction. So it has no ability to figure out whether there's oxygen, nitrogen atmospheres in any of these planets, that kind of thing, right? That's correct. Okay. If Kepler hasn't found any Earth-like planets yet, but rather has found Earth-sized planets yet, how likely do you think it is that it will find Earth-like planets? Well, Kepler will only find Earth-sized planets. We won't know if the planets are Earth-like. We, we don't have any way to look at their atmospheres of the Earth-sized planets and follow up for gases that might indicate that life is there. But let's go back to your question about what Kepler has found in terms of Earth-sized planets. You know, Kepler has found a number of uh, tens of planets that are Earth-sized or a little bit bigger. So Kepler is designed to find Earth-sized planets. Kepler will find a lot of Earth-sized planets. It's really just a matter of time before the telescope gets enough data to find them. And how do you eventually, which I presume is years down the road, take the next step, which is to classify them not just as Earth-sized, but actually Earth-like? Well, some of Kepler's planet, okay, let me answer the question directly. We will never classify Kepler Earth-sized planets as Earth-like. We will be able to classify some of them as Earth-like and Earth-mass. So we'll know that they are the same size as Earth and the same mass as Earth. Kepler's goal is just to tell us how common other Earths are so that we might take our next step in finding planets that are closer to home that are Earth-like. Okay, but you're, I, you're anticipating where I'm going to go with this, I guess, which is that if somewhere down the road, uh, if not Kepler, then others who analyze the data or get more data, if they eventually discover that there are other Earth-like planets out there, what does NASA do next? Well, let me tell you something. I personally have been working for over 10 years as, as well with a number of other people on just waiting for Kepler to give an answer. You know, for the last, say, 15 years, myself and others have been working on what would the next step be. We call it terrestrial planet finder. It would be a space-based telescope that would look around the nearest 100 stars for planets like Earth. And one of the many reasons why nothing has happened yet in moving that forward a big, in a big way is we just don't know how common other Earths are. If we only have 100 nearby stars that we can really find a true Earth-like planet, we better be sure that Earths are common before we go ahead. So trust me, myself and others, we're waiting, 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 waiting for years for Kepler's answer. So we know what we're going to do next. Is this frustrating, Sarah? Not at all, because it's a long way to go to do the technology to actually find those other Earths. Yeah, but if I'd spent 10 years looking for something and I still wasn't sure I was any closer to finding what I was looking for, I think I might be a little bit frustrated. You're not, you're not uh, just a little bit upset about well, this? Well, because it's, there's a lot of, it's like this. Imagine you're doing a trek across Canada, and your goal is to go from the East Coast, from Halifax, out to Vancouver. And your goal is Vancouver, but how long would it take to get out there? A decade, maybe two decades. That's your end goal, and you're going to be pretty excited when you get there. But you know what? There's so much to find along the way that you're going to be so busy all the time. It's not like you're going to have a lack of interesting things to do on your journey. And so we're on this big journey that's supposed to take decades or less, hopefully. And that's where we're at. Okay, I appreciate I mean, finding that. An Earth, it's, yeah, I mean, finding an Earth is one of the hardest problems. It's mm -hmm. the hardest problem basically ever faced by astronomers and one of the hardest scientific problems ever. In which case, what are you going to find along the way before you get to, if I can use your analogy, before you get to Vancouver, what are you going to find along the way that's going to be you know, exciting enough to keep you in the game? Well, I will actually focus, let me focus, I'll skip everything and focus on one thing that is interesting as well as Earth. And that is instead of the true Earth twin, think of your tr the true Earth twin, we actually have a chance in the short term to find planets that might have signs of life that are not quite like Earth. And these would be big Earths, a big Earth around a small star. Those types of planets people can find closer in the future. And although they're not really like Earth, 
they are planets that uh, we call them super Earths. And if we can find some of those orbiting small stars, we do have a chance to follow them up in the near future. So hmm. that might be one of the, that is one of the things. The other things we find are actually all the surprises. Almost everything we didn't anticipate is more interesting than the things we did anticipate. Kepler, for example, has found many, many, many multiple planet systems. That's planets with many, many planets. That is, other stars that have several planets all transiting. They're all going in front of the star as seen from Earth, or as seen from Kepler, rather. And some of them are just so tightly packed, we never, ever imagined, no one actually on the Kepler team, or maybe nobody on Earth, imagined that you could have so many planets all so tightly packed together in very close orbits. So we're just finding so many interesting things with Kepler and other ways that uh, we have no lack of interesting things to focus on in the short term. Fair enough, I accept that, but I'm wondering at, at the end of the day, whenever that comes, if and when you eventually make it to Vancouver, in inverted commas, uh, talk to us about the implications for human society of actually confirming that there are other, not Earth-sized, but Earth-like planets out there. What does that mean? Well, I think for, it means something different for each person, but I will say that I think for our society as a whole, it means that we can, we can start to acknowledge that we may not be alone in the universe. We've always wondered, is there life on another planet? And if we can find one or more Earth-like planets, we know that there's a chance for life to exist on those other worlds. And we will be able to answer the ancient question, are there other Earths out there? And what are they like? But actually, let me answer something else, not how it affects us today. Because I think for most of us, our life, our daily life, will not change. I like to think of it more from a perspective of what will happen hundreds or thousands of years from now. And I really, truly believe that thousands of years from now, when people look back at our 21st century society and they ask, what are the major things that, we, that they look back and remember as significant accomplishments, finding other Earths will be one of the big ones. Because at that time, they'll look back. They'll know of a lot of planets then. They'll have more sophisticated technologies to look for signs of life and maybe even robustly identify life on other worlds. And they'll look back to us as the first generation who actually made the first steps and found those first worlds. Hmm. Do you think we're alone? Absolutely not. We're definitely not alone. You know what? Our galaxy has 100 billion stars. And the universe has upwards of 100 billion galaxies. So the chance that there are planets out there with life is really high. I mean, no matter how rare Earths are, there's so many stars we can't even count them all. There's definitely another planet out there, lots of them, I'm sure, with life on them. It's just a matter for us of whether we can find those Earth-like planets around nearby stars and follow them up for signs of life. Well, let me just say, we wish you very well with your work, and I hope someday you make it to Vancouver. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Sarah Seeger, Professor of Planetary Science and Physics, MIT.